Welcome back to Suzy Reads and today we're doing another episode of Witches, Ghosts and Goblins and today we start chapter four where we get to meet the king of the goblins. Shall we get started? What's going to happen to Polly and Oliver? Are they going to get imprisoned by the king? Are they going to ever see their mom and dad again? Guess we better read and find out, huh? Chapter four, the king of the goblins. The most magnificent room in the great palace of the king of the goblins is the throne room. Here are the most highly prized treasures that the amazing mines of Monster Mountain have produced. The wondrous chandelier that lights the room is made entirely of diamonds. The mantle of the huge fireplace is encrusted with rubies and emeralds worth the king's ransom. From the tall windows of pure crystal hang drapes woven with silver thread. The king's throne is made of the finest goblin gold. And before his throne, seeking the king's pardon and his help, Miranda, Polly, Oliver, and the imp are to appear. What can they offer the king whose wealth is so great that no one else has been able to count it? The King of the Goblins. For most of the way, the ride to the great palace was a silent one. Polly thought about the stolen emerald and wondered how it found its way into her purse. Oliver kept searching his pockets to see if any more diamonds had popped into them unexpectedly. If Miranda knew how she was going to win the king's pardon for them, she kept the secret to herself. Once she rummaged in her owl-shaped bag until she found her crystal ball. For a while, she gazed into it and then, with a sigh, she put it back. Most unconcerned of all was the imp. He had fallen fast asleep between his two gnome guards and his snoring sounded rather like the purr of a cat. At last they came to the palace gates, whose silver scroll work gleamed in the bright sunlight. A guard motioned for them, motioned them through, and they had just started up the winding tree-lined drive when there was a loud bang. The imp woke up with a start. They're firing on us! He shouted at and threw himself to the floor of the car. Nonsense, said Miranda. It's a blowout. And true enough, the driver had hopped out of the car and was gazing in disgust at a very flat tire. Um, Miranda turned to her guard. Permit me, she said, with a tap on the shoulder. She asked the driver to please step back. Then she closed her eyes tightly bobbed her head three times. Tire repair, fill with air, she directed. And when she opened her eyes, the flat tire had been fixed. The gnome driver looked grateful and the guards smiled as they helped Miranda back into the car. It doesn't hurt to make friends wherever you have a chance, she whispered to Polly, not at all. The great palace was every bit as grand as they had expected it would be. They were marched up a long flight of stairs through huge bronze doors and into a vast hallway that could have held a small army. Wait here, their guard commanded, and he disappeared down a long passage. It was the first time they had been alone since they arrived at the tunnel's entrance at Monster Mountain. Let's make a run for it, the imp suggested. His eyes darted down the many hallways. For a moment, it sounded like a good idea to Polly and Oliver, for there was no doubt that they were in serious trouble. It seemed quite possible that they could outrun the short-legged gnomes who guarded the palace. Perhaps they could outwit them too, find a place to hide and make plans for an escape. Miranda interrupted their thoughts. If you think for one minute that we are not surrounded by guards and being watched constantly. You are even more foolish than I suspect. 
This, is this another of your plans, imp, to get us in trouble? Before the imp could answer, their guard returned. The king will see you now, he told them. Uniformed guards lined the long corridor down which they were escorted. Polly and Oliver hung on to Miranda, who smiled to the soldiers as she passed. Bouncing before them, the imp put on a great show of daring and even turned a cartwheel as they neared the golden doors that led to the king's throne room. Here, here, none of that, the head guard ordered. The imp turned and winked at them. Polly wondered why he was in such high spirits. With a great flourish, two splendidly clad soldiers opened the golden doors and Miranda's group was ushered into the throne room. For a moment, they were unable to see. So great was the brilliance of the sparkling gems and shining metal. They simply stood there wondering blindly what to do next. While they paused, a voice rang out like a deep-throated bell. All hail to the king! They knelt, as did everyone else in the throne room. Then, through an archway carved of solid emerald, the king of the goblins strode with measured step and proceeded to his throne. Not until he had seated himself did anyone stand. During the hush that followed, Polly studied his, this being who had the power to let them go free or imprison them for life. He was somewhat taller than Oliver, but under the weight of the royal crown and regal ermine cloak, he appeared shorter. His head, as round as an orange, was quite bald. Like twisted gnarled tree roots, his large hand twined around the arms of his throne. His green eyes glittered in the firelight and the sparkle of the jewels. A thin smile revealed sharp pointed teeth um, that revealed sharp pointed teeth never seemed to leave his face. Polly shuddered. The prisoners will step forward. The king's voice left no doubt that he was in command. As they moved closer, Polly became aware of two handsome cats resting on either side of the throne. Their golden color matched the surroundings. Their green eyes glittered like the king's, and now she remembered. Miranda had told her that goblins were very fond of cats. That was one of the reasons the witch had thought she might find help here. What are the charges against these four? The king asked. Approaching the throne, the clerk read from a long paper. First came the name of the prisoners and all the information the imp had given the guards on Monster Mountain. Then began the charges, unlawfully stopping the ma his majesty's train, plotting to raid his majesty's mines, illegal possession of a diamond belonging to his majesty, illegal possession of an emerald belonging to his majesty. We charge them guilty on all counts, the clerk announced. Miranda stepped forward. Father and nonsense, she said in a loud voice. A guard rushed out of the ranks to quiet her, but the king held up his hand. As you very well know, the witch announced to the room, I am Miranda Witch of Mysterious Castle. From her owl-shaped bag, she then drew a pack of her best witch in the business cards. Here, she ordered the clerk, pass these around. See that everyone gets one, she turned to the king. The charges, of course, are ridiculous. It was not a crime. It was only a trick, she nodded toward the imp. Not a very nice trick, but a trick all the same. The king looked puzzled. Witches, of course, were very clever and not to be trusted, but Miranda was a good witch. The king had reason to know. If you will, your majesty. Miranda continued, allow me to talk to the imp before your court. The king beckoned to the imp to join Miranda. 
The small fellow looked smaller than ever and quite frightened. Polly felt sorry for him. Now, Imp, Round stated, I have powers that I do not like to use, such as turning an imp into a mouse. She looked at the royal crowd, cats crouched before the throne. I suggest you confess. In an instant, the imp was on his knees. It was a trick, he squeaked. I stopped the tra train simply to borrow the jewels because I wanted the children to be sent back home. The diamond I sneaked into Oliver's pocket while we talked to the conductor. The emerald I dropped into Polly's purse when she told me how kind I had been. But honestly, your majesty, I knew the jewels would be found by the guard. I am not guilty of stealing. I am guilty of jealousy. He buried his face in his hands and his small shoulders shook with sobs. Both Polly and Oliver approached the king. Please forgive him, Polly implored. The imp peeked through his fingers as Oliver nodded in agreement. He looked at Miranda's face, which had softened somewhat, and at Polly, whose eyes glistened with tears. He smiled between his sobs, which grew louder than ever. The king pulled his ermine cloak more tightly about his shoulders. He was forever cold, and of late there had been rheumatic pains. It was a very nasty trick, he said, and shook his head from side to side. Miranda gave the king a long, thoughtful look. Must I remind your majesty that you do owe me a favor. Do you recall a certain Halloween when you fell into my moat? Who fished you out, sir? And who brought you to your palace door on her broomstick? Yes, well, yes, yes, to be sure, the king replied hastily. In view of the facts, perhaps a garden can be granted. Which brings us to the purpose of the trip, Miranda pressed on. She was now quite near the king's throne. For a moment, she paused and stroked first one and then the other of the royal cats. Beautiful cats. Your majesty, you must be very, very fond of them. His majesty's smile seemed a bit warmer. I raised them from kittens, he said. Their mother belonged to our dear departed queen, my wife. Then you must realize, Miranda continued, how deeply I miss my cat cactus. My cat who has disappeared. Goblins are famous as tracers of missing cats. I had hoped your majesty that you and your fellow goblins would aid me in finding my dear cactus. She paused. There is a reward. The king bent forward. And what is your reward? Her eyes glittered, his teeth gleamed. Jewels you have in abundance, Miranda answered, and gold and silver enough for a thousand kingdoms. But I have observed that goblins are a little short on magic. From her owl-shaped bag, Miranda held aloft her crystal ball. To whoever finds cactus, I will give Miranda's magic crystal ball an excited murmur rose from the crowded court. It's broken, said the king. It doesn't work. Bother, returned Miranda. How did you know? The king bowed in the direction of his faithful guards. It was reported that you attempted to use it on your trip to the great palace with absolutely no results. Miranda blushed slightly. Of course, I intend to have it repaired she regained her dignity. Must I remind me, you that you owe me a favor? The king rose from his throne. All the court, except Miranda, Polly, Oliver, and the imp, knelt once again. The favor I owed you was repaid when I granted the four of you a pardon. It is each of you who are now in my debt. He nodded ever so slightly. Perhaps, perhaps we will look for the cat. Meanwhile, I shall think of something that each of you can do for me. Anything, Miranda said recklessly. We will do anything. 
Thank you, the king returned. Then you will appear here in the morning before my throne. By then I shall have devised your tasks. Meanwhile, consider yourselves my guests. He smiled his mirthless smile. smile. Unfortunately, you must be confined to the palace grounds. I trust you will enjoy yourselves. He strode from the room. The head guard approached the four of them. Your quarters will be prepared immediately. The king, oh, Miranda, and the others merely nodded at him. They were wondering what tasks they would be asked to do. And that is the end of chapter four of Witches, Ghosts, and Goblins. And tomorrow we will read about what their tasks will be. What do you think they will be? Do you think they will have to clean the palace? Maybe they'll have to polish all the rubies and the emeralds and the diamonds. Hmm. Do you think that their quarters will actually be a dungeon? We'll find out next week. See you soon. Bye-bye.